Hello, this is Dana Joya. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Red Hen Poetry Hour. And I'm going to begin with a poem that Kate Gale of Red Hen suggested. It's called The End of the World, and it describes a real place. We're going, they said, to the end of the world. So we stopped the car where the river curled, and we scrambled down beneath the bridge on a gravel track of a narrow ridge. We tramped for miles on a wooded walk where dog hobble grew on its twisted stalk. Then we stopped to rest on a pine needle floor while two ospreys watched from an oak by the shore. We came to a bend where the river grew wide and green mountains rose on the opposite side. My guides moved back. I stood alone as the current streaked over smooth, flat stone. Shelf by stone shelf, the river fell. The white water goose-tailed with eddying swell. Faster and louder, the current dropped till it reached the cliff and the trail stopped. I stood on the edge while the mist ascended, my journey done where the world ended. I looked downstream, there was nothing but sky, the sound of the water, and the water's reply. Joya, incredible reading. And with that, welcome to the Broad Stage at Home inaugural program. We begin with the Red Hen Press Poetry Hour. Welcome. I'm Sandra Singh Lowe from my messy house, and I'm honored to be moderating our distinguished panel for this hour. The panelists include Rob Bayless, Artistic and Executive Director of the Broad Stage, Kate Gale, Co-Founder and Managing Editor of Red Hen Press, hello, and of course, the wonderful Dana Joya, former California Poet Laureate and, chairman of the, and former Chairman of the National Endowment of the Arts. So uh, those are three panelists to begin with. What I'm going to do is I'm going to begin with two questions for you. I want to let our audience at home know that in the comments section, you can be commenting and asking questions along the way. And we'll, with our incredible technology and split second um, processing, we'll get those uh, uh, up for you. Uh, and so the first question that I'm going to ask in this sort of a roundtable introduction to the three of you, first Rob, then Kate, then Dana, is poetry in this moment. Why are we here? What are we doing tonight? What are we talking about? And second, and it's for you in the audience to figure out what is your poetry wine pairing for this evening? Uh, mine is, uh, I went to Everson Ro Royce, Joe, the wonderful Joe Capella, I'm doing this. And he suggested a wine from a company called the Fabulist Wine Company, which is a fantastic title. They're in Paso Robles. And with each of their bottles, they have a poem on the back. This is a 10 second poem I will read. Just as the scorpion told the frog it would not sting, we had vowed to avoid Pas Paso's precious zin. In the end though, the Fabulist resides in Paso Robles and Paso Robles winemakers crafts Zinfandel. That's <laughs> that's wine on the bottle. Uh, I will be uncorking it while you talk because you guys are the experts on poetry. So please, if you could begin, Rob, why are we here? Well, Sandra, thank you. And Sandra, Kate and, and Dana, it's a, just a joy to be with you and with all the poets here tonight. Um, welcome to the Broad Stage at home. Um, we're really thrilled to launch this, especially with this event with Red Hand. And I personally am thrilled in part because I'm just a giant fan of poetry. Um, as many of you know, the Broad Stage is largely dedicated to music, dance, and theater. Um, but we're also committed to the literary arts. And we've had a wonderful relationship with live poetry through Red Hen. And for, for me personally, it's wonderful because poetry is really a lot of where, where I live. It's a lot of what I read. Uh, it's the last thing I read every night. Um, I always have a stack of poetry on my nightstand and typically on every surface of my home. Um, Part of that for me personally is because I really do think our poets are the ones who, who come at our world with the sharpest tools 
uh, to dissect even the most minute differences of experience. And for me, that's something all of us are probably having a little bit of right now, as we sit in isolation and find ourselves looking inward, who better to be with than someone who's very good at it, and probably that's a poet. So I've enjoyed taking a tremendous amount of comfort uh, in, in reading um, and in finding that uh, to get me through this remarkable time. Um, I also feel like we, we go to the theater uh, for the most part to experience our shared human potential and just to be blown away by what someone's capable of. And it's important to remind ourselves, even while we are not convening, that that's still true that we will get through this particular moment because of our shared human potential and because of what we can all do for each other, even at a distance. So I'm thrilled to share this isolation with you with my messy living room with you. And um, I'm looking forward to many more evenings where we can get to the bottom of it together. Speaking of getting to the bottom of it. Yes, good. The woman Karen. So <laughs> it's a bottle of Foresight, which is a wonderful, uh, winery in Boonville, California. Oh. And I will say about Foresight that I chose it not only because I'm a member of their club and I love their wine, but I had to choose it for the name, uh, unironically and unapologetically, because Foresight is what I wish our government had had just a little bit more of. On to you, Kate. Well, I don't have my bottle of wine with me, unfortunately, but we are going to open a bottle of Victor Hugo later. Uh, ah. Victor Hugo is also a Paso Robles wine, uh, and we really like that. Um, but on the subject of poetry, um, you know, when I started reading and writing poetry and thinking as a poet, um, I was a young person, I was 18, um, and I was I was very much uh, kind of half living out of my car. My my whole life was a crisis, and you know as I started to grow up and and eventually I was kind of putting myself through college. I realized that for most Americans, poetry wasn't something they were turning to all the time because, frankly, most Americans live more comfortable lives at least than I was living. Um, but they turn to they turn to poetry in in crisis in their lives. And I think that right now feels a bit like a crisis for a lot of Americans. Um, and, and so I think that's part of the reason that uh, this poetry feels very important. But I think that part of the reason that this poetry um, was, was so carefully curated tonight and that mo many people are going to enjoy it is that all the poetry you're gonna hear tonight, whether you're a poet or not, I think you'll be able to understand it. And I think that there has been a tendency for poetry in the last few years to exclude non-poets. Dana and I have had a lot of conversations about this, but um, I hope that all of you who are listening tonight will realize that whether you're a poet or not, there's, there are, there's a lot of poetry that you can climb inside of and wrap your head around and it will change your life. On to you, Dana. Well, let me begin by extending a virtual hand of welcome to my fellow artists, especially all those actors, singers, dancers, musicians who are out of work right now. Uh, I, you know, you know, hope that this evening is somehow, you know, clarifying. And in, in, uh, when you think about poetry, most of what poetry is is lyric poetry, which is to say, it's a way of speaking about what it is like to live precisely in a particular moment in a particular way, to look on that moment and have some sort of perspective on that versus the rest of life. And that really is the glory of poetry. It's the primary task that poetry you know, has done for civilization. So I think in the moment that we're in right now, when we're, you know, we're all housebound, uh, we're all anxious, we're isolated, you know, poetry is, as Robert Frost said, gives us a momentary stay against confusion. Momentary stay against confusion. Um, confusion as in marriage. <laughs> what do you think about transition? Because you have a poem coming for us that is, you know, it's, you know, lyric in the moment. It, it is, it, it speaks so much, I, I think, to that. Would you like to intro well, it a bit? If, you know, poetry almost always has one eye at mortality, which is to say when you realize that your life is finite, that there's life is mortal, it gives you a more intense appreciation of what you actually have. And so this is really a poem about 
marriage and mortality, about joy, and about language. To the video. The poem is called Mary. When you're married, your spouse and you gradually develop a private language, and it becomes the most intimate form of communication you'll ever experience. <laughs> Most of what happens, happens beyond words. The lexicon of lip and fingertip defies translation into common speech. I recognize the musk of your dark hair. It always thrills me, though I can't describe it. My finger on your thigh does not touch skin. It touches your skin warming to my touch. You are a language I have learned by heart. This intimate patois will vanish with us. It's only native speakers. Does it matter? Our tribal chants, our dances round the fire, performed the sorcery we most required. They bound us in a spell time could not break. Let the young vaunt their ecstasy. We keep our tribe of two in solemn secrecy. What must be lost was never lost on us. In case you're just joining us, welcome to the inaugural program of the Broad Stage at Home. This is the Red Hen Press Poetry Hour, streaming live for you on Facebook now um, as we work out. And it's live, which is great. So some things go exactly the way we think, some don't. And uh, we're just so happy you're here. And remember that you can comment in our comments section, and there'll be other live readings this hour till we go until nine. Um, and uh, is our panel there? There they are, the fantastic panel of ours, Rob Bayless, Kate Gale, and Dana Joya. Um, I mean, thoughts in this particular time, I mean, you're all writers and creators, um, you know, and Rob, you have such a, such a deep performance background that ties with your poetry. Kate, you're a writer and a publisher. Dana, you've done it all as well. Um, do you feel, you know, between an urge to, is there an urge to read, to write, to share? Are those different instincts? How does that feel for you? I think they're all going on at once right now. I mean, I think, that, you know, from people are right now sheltering in place. And I get a constant uh, stream of phone calls, of emails, of texts, because people feel isolated and they want community. You know, poetry we think of as this very private art, something that people write at night in the intensity of their solitude. But poetry is also a kind of way of public speaking. And so I think, you know, once again, sort of like what Rob said, poets are in an interesting situation because our skill is really to say the most things possible in the least words possible. <laughs> in which uh, we don't only communicate thought, but we communicate feeling. And I think people right now want to feel not alone. They want to feel connected and they want to feel some sense of perspective. I mean, but, but you feel also as a creator, it's kind of, no, I need my time to create. I need time to breathe as opposed to serving my community right now. Or do you find a balance between that of when the craft comes in, you can you write it in one night and put it out? I mean, how, how do you balance the craft versus community question, if that's even two different things. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, 
I'm completely distracted right now. What about you guys? <laughs> you know, for me, oddly, I have been drawn back to wanting to practice. So ultimately, I, you know, I'm I'm a musician. I'm a clarinetist, and you know, when, when I'm stuck with a a, a blank sp space in an empty room, that's what I do. You know, it's it's all those years and years and years of five hours in a practice room alone sorting something out that gets you ready for, as, as Dana points out, your public speaking. So I feel like I've been strangely given a research period that I hadn't anticipated. And I'm quite grateful for that as one of the fringe benefits of what is otherwise a very complicated time. Um, but certainly the, the, the mixture that we're going to be seeing over the next few months, and I think the next, possibly the next year or two, about when is something finished? When is something in process? When do you share something? When when is it ready? Is now a transformed landscape. All bets are kind of off around that. So the 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 perfectionism and the sort of whittling down of things to that last minute and then fla flashing a light on it and putting it out in public is uh, I think going to look very different for the next little while and maybe forever. Maybe that's an interesting transformation of those ideas that will come from this. I I think that um, uh, that you know when you when you run an organization and you're also a writer that you're always wearing those two different hats. And for me, um, for better or for worse, during this time, maybe I'm the opposite of you, Rob. But um, I have dug into uh, working with my left brain, not my right brain, um, on Red Hen. I'm 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 in Red Hen mode right now. Um, because I need to, I need to carry Red Hen through this crisis, um, and then, and and but the writing that I've been doing is essays related to what it feels like to be stuck in my house uh, all the time and have no one to talk with but my husband and my dog, and um, and you know, we're not having a shining moment, but um, uh, but it, it still does feel kind of strange. Um, so I've been writing about that. Um, I've been writing some essays, but I, I definitely think that there will be novels and stories and poems and, and certainly yeah, the movies are being written um, about this. Um, but for me personally, it, it, I, have, uh, I have muscled up in the administrative department um, because I feel like I have to. Um, but I think that um, there are a lot of writers right now that are working on uh, poems and stories and plays uh, around this. And I think of like the, the book, The Emperor's Children, which was written about 9-11 um, by Clarence Sue. I, I know that there will be books like that in, in which this, this moment becomes part of the novel or story. And I, I'm looking forward to, to reading some of those. I hope they'll be good. I hope they'll be good. <laughs> And Dana, you said something if just about public speaking, and I and I didn't mean to interrupt you. The, the thing is a little jumpy, but if there's a kind of language that poets use, because of course we have so many politicians and their public speaking, is there a vibration of language that poets use that is a manner of public speaking that's yeah. different? Well, I think this is something you know that Kate and I have often talked about is that poetry lost its public idiom. You know, poetry used to be a very powerful way of you know creating you know, a poem which invited non-poets, invited the young, the old, a kind of civic, you know, sound. And, and, and it's, it, it was interesting when I said things are quite different now. There's a poem I've been working on, for, you know, for about three or four months about Los Angeles. And I couldn't finish it until and then suddenly everything started looking different. I started feeling it differently and the poem completed itself. And so, I, you know, I think we're in a, in a, in a stage right now as poets that we understand the value of poetry as a kind of, of uh, communal speech, a civic speech, which doesn't mean bringing it down to the level of politicians, that means reaching out to other people. Mm -hmm. Very, very profound. I mean, what, and can you, when what was about the time historically or literarily where that connection was lost, when the poet spoke for so many? I think historically you see it ending around uh, right after World War One, I. I mean, until then, poetry was the most popular art. I mean, people, you know, poets were bestsellers. People knew contemporary poems by heart. Poetry was in the newspapers. Poetry was at every level of education. Then, over the course of you know the twentieth century, you know, really as a reaction to World War One and the advent of modernism, mm -hmm. it became more and more a kind of 
of uh, rarefied literary art, which doesn't mean that it isn't great in its own way, but it does mean that of all the various uses that poetry once had, it began to shrink. Now, I mean, let me say something most people don't know. The best-selling books in the United States are still poetry. If you look at the at the bestseller list, every, you know, every at any moment, about six out of ten are poetry, and they're all written by a, a California poet named Theodore Geisel, uh, who <laughs> Uh, which says that, I mean, there's still this hunger for poetry. You celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and retirements by giving people a book of poetry. Uh, un unfortunately, it's mostly books by Dr. Seuss, which are wonderful in and of themselves, but it just shows you, uh, you know, what a gap we have between all the possibilities of the art and the reality. Mm. Yes. Thoughts, Rob, Kate, on that? I mean, I, I don't know that I can um, add to that historically i think that that um what i'm thinking about at this moment more than anything is how we're going to come out of this and and what kind of a gap we're looking at before we we sort of you know uh, resume activity or what find ourselves in it in our next space and and who is going to be able to be there who might we lose unfortunately um what do we need to do if we're trying to build a bridge to that moment and and how do we undertake it? And I, I I do think all those things come into these very intimate conversations of of where we are right now. There's there's a there's an opportunity in all of this. There's there's kind of a potential for a massive cultural reset button to get hit. Um, and while I I don't espouse that necessarily or think it, it's necessarily the best idea, it's certainly a possibility. So I've been interested in, in what comes next and how we're going to get there. Um, that's really been on my mind a lot. And as, as you mentioned, Dana, just, it's, it's also just on my mind that there are a lot of people really, really suffering right now. And that's, that's also very front of mind, um, but it's necessary to find a path. Can I say a, a, a piece of positive news that really supports what you're saying, Rob? And it also, I think we should give hope to Kate, you know, who's dedicated to keeping red you know hand press alive and vital it's the most important literary press in the southland right now the good news is that poetry is currently the fastest growing art in the united states the audience among the young for poetry has doubled in the last 10 years so we have to precondition rob for the the, the kind of renaissance that you're longing for mm -hmm. And I think also, I, I love what uh, Kate said that coming to uh, poetry in crisis as a young person, because I think I have two uh, kids, 17 and 19, and certainly today with all the distraction and the streaming and the Netflix, there's something about the word that the vibration that's so pure and it's contemplative and it's mm -hmm. a slowing down that almost calms people in a moment that I think there could really be a path for poetry for the next generation of people as well, just, just at aside from all this chatter, just to hear the word. And that's why we're gonna be hearing more poetry in the second half of this hour coming up shortly, so we can savor that. But yes, Kate, there's hope. Yes, <laughs> well, I, I agree with you, Rob. I think that that partly because of these kinds of events that uh, the Broad Stage and other organizations are gonna be doing, I think that we will have this um, moment where we have a shift in the culture. And one of that sh those shifts I think will be that we will become more responsive to what audiences want. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that like, for example, it'd be so interesting to know of everything that you've got coming up at the Broad stage, if you asked audiences um, what they're most excited about and got a, started polling, what, what are audiences most excited about coming back to in the fall? Yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm just throwing that out there. But I mean, like, I think that when young people come to the Broad stage, it, it would be interesting to know what, what shows they can't wait to see because the season that you had lined up was just thrilling, as as I saw it um, when you showed it to me. It was it's beyond thrilling what you've got what you've got coming, and uh, I can't wait to see it um, when it comes in the fall. And I know your audience is going to love it as well. And I hope that it happens because it's you are such a dynamic, energetic um, d designer of of, of uh, programming. Thank you. And and I think a Very question that will come as as the broad stage figures this out and the broad at home is also lovely as well it's like what will the role of performance continue to be when we can't always get together in the same space yeah that's 
Okay, so I, I'd like to turn for a moment as we go into some of our uh, other poets today, um, Kate, and, and thanks to Dana and Rob, you're going to still stay with us, but we're going to talk for a moment about uh, our second uh, half of this hour. So Kate, can you tell me a little bit about blank verse films? Yes, um, I have to say, Dana, I'm hoping you'll say a little word on this too, since you actually know more about it than I do. Um, but Blank First Films is, um, it is done by Mike Joya. And Mike Joya um, obviously loves poetry, but knows a lot about film. And so he thought about this as a way to have a poem tell a story. And what you'll see when you see these, um, when you see each of these videos is that he very thoughtfully worked these out so that you're not just listening to, to a poem, a poet read something. Because when you read, when you listen to a poet just read a video, it, it, it isn't always all that engaging. But the way he films them is you enter the narrator's life in a way. <laughs> and how would you better describe that, Dana? Well, I think it's perfect. I would add one thing is that one of the reasons that Mike created this series, because he the other things he does are comedy videos, is that his gener people in his generation like poetry, but they feel more comfortable uh, engaging with poetry, especially engaging with a new poet on film rather than on the page. And so, you know, what he's looks mm -hmm. like kind of new medium, you know, for poetry, which is more natural for basically people in their twenties. Right. 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 And with that, shall we turn to our first uh, video? It's Doug Manuel with his poem, get ready for it, Christian Parents. Are you ready to help the parents of this child in their duty as Christian parents? My godmother answered yes and traced the sign of the cross on my forehead. I'm driving to Seer, pines blotching the side of the road. I want Cindy to stay young. She uses a walker now, an old woman, curly hair and wrinkled hands, soft as feathers. In her backyard, we feed birds bread. Pigeons so close we could christen them. Wrens and warblers conjugate. Cindy drove me to church every Sunday after my mother died. Before I leave today, she'll make me recite the rosary in the parlor. Sunlight revealing new lines on her face. We don't go to church anymore. She doesn't travel well. Christmas and Easter, the only times we step inside St. Mary's. Make a wish, she says. The Cardinals just landed. Red cap, sharp as the Pope's hat. Cindy was mother's catechism sponsor. She remembers her voice. I can't. This pecks at me, so I tell her. But I've never told her how I call her my fairy white godmother. Never admit it that I no longer believe. As always, when we go inside, I light the votive candle. Wonderful. And now we turn to a live poet, live in the moment, Brendan Constantine. His first poem will be When You Can Get It. Hello. Thank you, Sandra. And thanks to all of you who are uh, watching this evening. As Sandra said, this first poem is called When You Can Get It. A woman went to the perfume counter and asked, what scent 
says, I think it rained last night. The clerk turned to her cabinet, put her hands on her hips, then offered a small blue bottle. The woman put a drop on her wrist. It smelled of jasmine and wood smoke. There was also iron and something like mint, only colder. No, she said. I mean, I think it rained, but I'm not sure. The clerk consulted her bottles again, opened a drawer by her feet. Finally, she went to a coat hung on the back of a chair and dug in the pockets. She withdrew something tiny and held it out. It was a gray bird, wet and alive. Its throat flashed purple and green as it panted. This is the last of it, she said. I, uh, I think uh, I really like what uh, Dana said about poetry and uh, about that unique perspective that, uh, that comes for a particular time. I also think that most poetry begins with a total loss for words. And I've tried to choose poems that, um, that are effectively trying to say something unsayable. At least I hope that's the case with this next poem. This poem is called, This Page Ripped Out and Rolled Into a Ball. A rose by any other name could be Miguel or Tiffany, could be David or Vashti. Why not Aya, which means beautiful flower, but also verse and miracle and a bird that flies away quickly. You see where this is going. That is, you could look at a rose and call it, you see where this is going, or I knew this would happen, or even why wasn't I told? I'm told of a man who does portraits for money on the beach. He paints them with one arm, the other he left behind in a war. And so he tucks a rose into his cuff, always yellow, and people stare at it, pinned to his shoulder while he works. Call the rose Panos, because I think that's his name, or call it a chair by the sea. Point from the window to the garden and say, look, a bed of painter's hands. And this is a good place to remember that the rose already has many names because language is old and can't agree with itself. In Albania, you say trendafil. In Somalia, say kake. In American poetry, it is the flower you must never name. And now you see where this is going. Out the window across water to a rose-shaped island that can't exist, but you're counting on to be there, unmapped, unmentioned till now, the green place you imagine hiding when the world finds out you're not who you've said. And finally, um, a phrase I've been hearing a lot, uh, the elephant in the room uh, seems to be coming up a lot. There seems to be, I can't really tell whether there's one big elephant in the room these days or a lot of little ones, whether this curious time that we're living in is characterized by one problem or, uh, or a series of them. Uh, but there does seem to be a lot that uh, we're a little afraid to talk about. And as I say, I keep hearing that phrase. This is a poem I wrote a while ago when there was different elephants in the room. And of course, what characterizes the elephant in the room is that it's a thing you're not supposed to talk about. So I wanted to turn that idea on its head and instead write about uh, an absolute freedom to communicate and, uh, 
when we communicate with each other and it's easy and intuitive and free. And so for my last poem, I'd like to read this one. It's called The Room in the Elephant. We couldn't stop talking about it, how big it was and comfortable. Who doesn't wish their own room was so orderly, so keen to navigate? My chair was deep, the arms wide and velvet. I thought I'd never get out, but it was easy. The floors, the dark wood of the table were polished almost to water. Everyone was laughing, but couldn't say why. It simply felt right, like the painting on the ceiling of a market in Pompeii. There was light from somewhere, only now does that seem strange because there were no windows. I don't remember lamps or candles. It was as if everything cast a luster, including us. It's even possible that our eyes were closed, that the room put itself in mind and we could just see. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. My mind is blown. I am the elephant. I am the room. I am the. Uh, uh, it's it's amazing how in such a short period of time there's so the language and so many images can come up that it is just a pleasure a pleasure to hear. So oh, thank you so much. Thank you. So in case you're just joining us, this is the inaugural program of the Broad Stage at Home from our homes to yours. Um, and this is the Red Hen Press Poetry Hour, streaming live until 9 p.m. tonight. Uh, visit our comments section for your thoughts and questions. Now, up next, we have a video. Uh, and this is Francesca Bell with You Can Call Me Ma'am. Having turned 42, having menstruated, lo, these 30 years, most often on my hands and knees, or curled, drugged, and sobbing around a hot water bottle, having borne three children and been stretch marked and bloated beyond recognition, having pushed those babies from my womb as each skull crowned like live coals against my perineum and lodged for good measure up my ass. Having bled and sweated and nursed, breasts rock hard and nipples like paper doused in lighter fluid and each child's mouth a struck match. Having pled and dragged three children to inoculations and speech therapists, to grocery stores and Jiffy Lube and my gynecologist's office, to 180 school drop-offs and 365 whining, shrieking bedtimes every year. Having brushed, my God, so many reluctant teeth and forced the good green vegetables down and been pissed, shit, and retched on, until now, all are more or less righted and headed willingly where they ought to be going. I love you. I love you too. Having, as I said, turned 42, I don't want you calling me miss or acid washing even one line from my face or lopping off the part of my belly my children made soft. I don't want you lifting the breasts they pulled down while they took my good milk, or repairing the scar on my nipple where one bit down and left a searing infection, a wound that puckered like a mouth and oozed into my bra while I nursed through it. I don't even want you rinsing the new silver from my hair. I like its steel. 
I am as sharp as a thistle now. No deer can lop into a nub. Let me tell you, at 42, it is a deep, delicious pleasure not to be dewy or fresh as a fucking daisy. And now we're so pleased to have with us live, who you saw earlier on video, Doug Manuel. His poem then was Christian Parents. And now here he's live to talk to us about another poem. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Um, I will be sipping on a little rosé for my wine pairing. Let me take a drink. But yeah, first off, I want to thank the Broad, Red Hen, Dana, Kate, Brendan, Felicia, and Jason, both who you're here later. It's just such a pleasure to be connecting with you guys in this way during this troublesome time. So thank you so much. And thank you so much to the crowd. I want to shout out my family watching. Hi, Erica. So yes, so good to see all of you guys. The first poem uh, I'm going to read is called Let's Get Small. It's from a new manuscript. And yeah, called Trouble Funk. And my parents got together in the late 80, uh, late 70s, early 80s. And my dad was a DJ. So music informed so much of their existence. And at times when things are tough, music always is something that I go back to. So I thought it'd be relevant to read this poem. This one is called Every Poem in a Manuscript is Named After a Song that My Father Used to Spin. So this one's called Let's Get Small. And that's from the band Trouble Funk. Thank you so much again, guys. Let's get small. Same scream since the night before. She's locked herself in the bathroom. He's holding up the bathroom door with his back. Another job gone. The song of another woman all over his lips. Caught. She could taste it. She screams, he screams, their scream. She screams, he screams, their scream. The same scream they began with. The same scream they'll end with, but really it's older than that, deeper and oh so black. The same scream since the Middle Passage, since slavery, since Reconstruction, since Jim Crow, since the Great Migration, since redlining, since the Civil Rights Movement. So many screams slicing love. But music is the stitches, forgiveness inside a drum. He walks to the record player, puts on their song. The times for four, hard on the downbeats, staccato. Something to dance to, something to survive through, something to die to. The bathroom door sighs open, a mouth full of silence. So for the next poem, um, my uh, great aunt just turned 80 years old, and I often go to her when um, times get rough because I know that her body carries so much knowledge and so much knowledge of what kept us going uh, through all the bad times as far as African-Americans and African-American experience. So this poem is based off a little bit of a poem I wrote for her birthday and then also me trying to think about the times right now. This one is entitled, these aren't the darkest times. And thank you again, everyone. I'm so glad all y'all here. These aren't the darkest times. My auntie's 80 years old. She's seen all the ways white folks can be their worst self. All the ways they made themselves white and us black. All the ways black bodies can be made beasts of burden. All the ways white folks can desecrate and destroy. All the ways their joys are white, glorious houses built on the black ruins of what we love, what we are. Our blood, our sweat, the milk feeding and fueling their American dream. Her eyes know the machinery of colors here, whites there. How habit won't detach itself, how segregation never left, 
how it just morphed, just as the ice cube is the same water you froze earlier and the same sweat on your cup afterwards. She's picked cotton, talked about how the ax shredded her hands, talked about how a day was a lifetime because the only way to mark the time was the sky and she didn't know how to read the sun. She's been sent to the back of shops, the back of the bus, drank from colored only water fountains and felt the fear of the news. Dougie, they just left one swinging there in Big Mama's mahogany tree. 80 years she's been here. 80 years she's seen things that America has tried to forget. Her eyes don't forget. Or more blue gray than black. I've only seen her cry once. And that's when Nat King Cole's When I Fall in Love came on the radio. She said it reminded her of her dead husband, my uncle. When I asked her if she was scared of the coronavirus, she told me, nah, we just got to be better to each other, Dougie. That's how we make it through anything together. And I looked into her eyes and I could see that noose hanging from the mahogany tree. And I knew she was right. Thank you guys so much. Please be safe, healthy, and stay sane during these times, y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Powerful. And I love hearing you read that I, I feel like I'm in your apartment and we're having a poetry house party. <laughs> it's like, no. so there's you and your rosé, no sir. <laughs> All right. Yes, Next, cheers, cheers, cheers. Yeah, clinking in the screen. Clink. Okay, thank you. All right. Next we go to Brendan Constantine via video. And this is a piece called The Opposite Game. The Opposites Game, for Patricia Mesh. This day, my students and I play The Opposites Game with a line from Emily Dickinson. My life had stood a loaded gun, it goes, and I write it on the board, pausing so they can call out the antonyms. My, your, life, death, had stood, will sit, a, many, loaded, empty, gun, gun. For a moment, very much like the one between lightning and its sound, the children just stare at me, and then it comes, a flurry, a hailstorm of answers. Flower, says one. No, book, says another. That's stupid, cries a third. The opposite of a gun is a pillow, or maybe a hug, but not a book. No way is it a book. With this, the others gather their thoughts, and suddenly it's a shouting match. No one can agree. For every student, there's a final answer. It's a song, a prayer, I mean a promise, like a wedding ring, and later a baby. Or what's that person who delivers babies? A midwife? Yes, a midwife. No, that's wrong. You're so wrong you'll never be right again. It's a whisper, a star. It's saying I love you into your hand and then touching someone's ear. Are you crazy? Are you the president of stupid land? You should be. When's the election? It's a teddy bear, a sword, a perfect, perfect peach. Go back to the first one. It's a flower, a white rose. When the bell rings, I reach for an eraser, but a girl snatches it from my hand. Nothing's decided, she says. We're not done here. I leave all the answers on the board. The next day, some of them have stopped talking to each other. They've taken sides. There's a flower club and a kitten club and two boys calling themselves the Snowballs. The rest have stuck with the original game, which was to try to write something like poetry. It's a diamond, 
It's a dance. The opposite of a gun is a museum in France. It's the moon. It's a mirror. It's the sound of a bell and the hearer. The arguing starts again, more shouting, and finally, a new club. For the first time, I dare to push them. Maybe all of you are right, I say. Well, maybe. Maybe it's everything we said. Maybe it's everything we didn't say. It's words and the spaces for words. They're looking at each other now. It's everything in this room and outside this room and down the street and in the sky. It's everyone on campus and at the mall and all the people waiting at the hospital and the post office. And yeah, it's a flower too. All the flowers, the whole garden. The opposite of a gun is wherever you point it. Don't write that on the board, they say. Just say poem. Your death will sit through many empty poems. Wonderful. And now we welcome Felicia Zamora live with Poem to America. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I'm very happy to be here um, sharing my space and my home with you all. I hope everyone is being safe and taking care of each other. Um, they're unprecedented times and we need to be here for each other more than anything right now. Tonight, I'm gonna to be reading three poems from my book coming out next month, Body of Render from Red Hen Press. Um, the voices in this book explore the social trauma that took place after the 2016 election. It's an election year. It's 2020. We'll be voting for a president again. What happened during that social trauma is still going on for many people of color, queer and trans individuals, people with disabilities, women and other marginalized populations. We're in a pandemic, but those oppressions across this country have not stopped. These poems tonight and this book is for us. It's for everyone who has been belittled and had their freedoms taken away. This first poem, Poem to America. My nerves expose, unwilling. These cells and fibers race and transmit. Oh, impulse of me. Skin peeled away, how defense fails. And my eyes, oh eyes, in uncontrollable wet to witness, to experience decimation in the aortic sac. Oh, society, oh, what you call piece by piece, what you strip, what grows back over time. In time, hold these bones up to the light. Do you see me in porous cavities forming despite what torn and torn my flesh under your claws from hollow and cold and seamless i rise sow this heart anew i long to forgive you forgive unapologetic to you, dearest stranger, dearest amygdala, dearest burn in chest and production of, say, yes, you know the sensation. Flap and desire to stow in the underside of breeze, 
carry, say, away from fight. How you bind in cells, in impulses, and your brain all electrical, and you, conductor, producer of. Let's be clear. No apologies to America anymore. You no longer in hyper and the word nation, a sore on lips underside, and you in tongue in tongue. Velocity of pain, enormity of heel. How humanity and equity redact so simply from notions the jaws crank to apart together apart. Say, way of things now. No, you have a hand in it all. How brave outside the self you must be. Say, uterus apologizes no more. Say, Latina veins apologize no more. Say, clitoris apologizes no more. Say, these features that offend apologize no more. Say, oh country, oh, the weight of doors enclose flays your heart and all hearts inside, indigenous or immigrant, now plead with your lungs, country, oh country, hear our voices ignited. And again, this last piece is for all of us out there who are hurting right now. Be heard. Voice witness. Yes, voice. Let voice permeate from belly lining to spinal column. Lingle, linger brief at epiglottis before leap. Oh, what body draws this breath to word. Carve out inside you tunnels and windpipes. Sing despite brutality. What makes us, oh, elements of converge in instrument. Heard we must. How a nation yells, beats its chest. And you lovely flag burners, you lovely protesters, you lovely queer and colorful and disabled and undocumented by bell of voice, voice. You brave throat, voice witness for safe, for other, voice witness of all loveful, voice, yes, voice. Thank you all so much for being here and listening and sharing space tonight. Be safe, be healthy, take care of you. Thank you, Felicia, so powerful. Thank you for sharing, it just leaps right screen. Um, and thank you. Last but not least, although he is three hours ahead because he's in New York and it's midnight, is Jason Schneiderman. And he'll be reading three poems from his new collection, Hold Me Tight from Red Hand Press. And thank you for staying up with us, Jason. Thank you. I come to you from the future. Um, it's <laughs> wonderful to be here with the whole Red Hand family and Doug and Felicia and Brandon and just everyone and Kate and Dana. Thank you guys broad stage for making this happen. Peter and the Wolf Orchestra. After the conductor refuses to listen to their demands, the Wolf members of the orchestra simply refuse to play during the season's first performance of Peter and the Wolf. The conductor pushes forward and audience members are unsure of how to show solidarity with the silent wolf players. The wolves are fired and reform as the first all wolf orchestra and choose Peter and the wolf as their first production, though for the first time, Peter is cast as the villain and the wolf as the hero. Many parents complain as children who attend the performance are deeply ashamed of being Peters and often spend their days insisting that they want to be wolves. And some even try to run away from home to join 
the wolves. Very few of the children succeed in becoming wolves, though some of them do. Some people say you can tell a wolf who used to be a human child. Some people say you can't. Um, this book is built around five sequences and I'm reading from three of them. The Last War. The project was simple, though initially most people regarded it as misguided. We removed everyone under the age of 12 from every armed conflict. Anyone from 12 to 18 could stay and fight or go. Up to them. Adults left in war zones were sterilized using a gas cloud that could be wafted over battlefields, starving the conflicts of new combatants. Many people were sure that the children raised abroad by strangers would continue the conflicts. But having anticipated that probability, plans were carefully developed. The adopted parents were instructed to give contradictory answers, saying things like, oh, wait, no, your parents were Sunni, not Shia, or maybe Sufi, or no, I'm fairly sure you were Irish, or was it English? If the children demanded proof, our office created specially forged family trees to show one Hutu and one Tutsi parent, or one conquistador and one Aztec parent, or one Nazi and one Jew. It took a long time, generations. And our critics likened it to genocide or ethnic cleansing. And in a way, it was. But every person on the planet watched the last war with great pity the last two survivors of some ancient conflict, the war zones having gotten smaller and smaller, easily monitored with drones and satellite imaging. The last combatant shot the second to last combatant, and he rejoiced to have won, to have claimed for all his ancestors the piece of land that he would hold until he died under quarantine. He didn't ask to be let out. He knew we wouldn't let him, and so he died king of his shrunken domain, and after that, we went in, forgetfully, purposefully insistent on forgetting, determined to make no new history, to remember as little as possible. We have destroyed the archives. We have shredded and wiped and erased and burned. We have diaries in which we tear out the pages as soon as we fill them, and on the shelves we store nothing more than the empty book covers. We are visionary, we believe, in our belief that there will be no more fighting as long as there is nothing to fight about. And for my last poem, I'm gonna I'm I'm a little obsessed with Fanny Inlay, who you may know as Mary Shelley's younger half sister, um, the older daughter of. Um, Mary Wollstonecraft. And I think everything's in the poem. In memoriam, Fanny M. Lay, 1794 to 1816. When you ask yourself how people survived the 19th century before soap and antibiotics, before anesthesia and electricity, remember that not all of them did. Remember Fanny M. Lay in her hotel room drafting her suicide note before drinking laudanum. Remember the innkeeper who found her corpse and tore her name from the bottom of the note so that she could be buried in Christian ground. Remember Fanny Imlay's final words offering the blessing of forgetting that such a creature ever existed as I. Remainder, torn away. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you. Um, Shop local, support your local bookstores. They need you while they're closed. Absolutely, thanks so much, Jason. And, and you can go to bed now if you want. <laughs> thank you so much, <laughs> wonderful. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all the books also in first films. And I'd like to bring back our panelists, Dana Joya, Rob Bayless, and Kate Gale, once again for final quick thoughts. Here we are back again. I think this was just what we needed. Natural literary life. A bunch of poets hanging out on Saturday night, drinking and talking. <laughs> yes. Rob or Kate, who wants to go after that? 
I think poetry is going to keep us, get us through this. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think what struck me apart from the talents of the wonderful poets who, who read uh, and shared their films as well was that, that really basic feeling that, you know, human beings really need each other to make sense of the world. And um, there's just nobody better at that than poets. And I think this is just such a, an incredibly uplifting and, and very personal time to spend with people. And I'm looking forward to more of it, but thank you all so much for this. It was really, really a treat. Well, and thank you, Rob, and, and the Broad Stage for starting the Broad Stage at Home series. The timing seems really kind of perfect. And I know you're going from this whirlwind evening to tomorrow at 11 a.m., yeah. just, just a few short hours, you're going to be doing the Broad Stage as classical music hour and with bagels and coffee and mimosas, I guess. So <laughs> thank you so much for that. Thank you guys so much. Um, and so that's it for tonight's Red Hen Press Poetry Hour. Know that this series, this uh, episode is archived for you forever at thebroadstage.org and redhenpress.org at both their websites. And be sure to follow The Broad Stage on Facebook and Instagram social media, and also Red Hen Press on Facebook, Instagram, social media. And I think this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship amongst all. So um, thank you all so much. That's that's our poetry hour, and uh, it's been a thrill being here. Uh, stay safe. Thank, thank you. Sophie. Good night. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Good night. Good night.